sing a little louder. My weapon is a melody. Sing a little louder. Heaven comes to fight for me. Sing a little louder. In the presence of my enemies. Sing a little louder. Louder than the unbelief. Sing a little Good morning, church family. And if we have any visitors today, welcome to the Southern Cross. This morning, we'll continue in our Acts series. Last Sunday, we learned that the kingdom of God is an invisible kingdom that starts in our heart and works its way outward into all that we do and become in this life. Let's see where the story takes us this morning as we pick up in verse 17. If you'd like to follow along in the reading, but you don't have a Bible with you, just raise your hand and an usher will bring you one of our free Bibles at this time. Before Pastor Frank begins our teaching, let's watch a brief video concerning our persecuted brothers and sisters. These videos help remind us of why we support mission work in restricted nations with a monthly donation. Let's watch. In our Western society it is so easy to forget the suffering of the persecuted church. Because persecuted Christians follow Jesus Christ. They face isolation, destroying of property, violence, poverty, imprisonment, surveillance, church raids, expulsion and execution. This is not a reality for us in the Western world. But a daily reality for more than 340 million Christians around the world. As believers in the Western world. We have a responsibility towards our persecuted brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. The persecuted church is not another church, but part of the body of Christ that suffers for their faith in Jesus Christ. Will we let them suffer alone?
Well, it's good to be here this morning. I hope that you got something out of the video there. It's very, very touching. As Celestria said, it just helps remind us of why we, we support mission work in restricted nations with a monthly donation and why we, we partner with VOM in sending Bibles over to these places. So here, Peter is saying he remembers. He, say, he says that uh, he's telling his brothers that when he was at the house of Cornelius, the Roman centurion, and he was preaching the gospel, he witnessed something. He's telling them. I, I, he witnessed something very significant, very exciting for Peter. Uh, uh, very profound might be an accurate way to state it. Peter witnessed a profound thing. See, they had never ever considered God bringing the Gentiles into the fold. But I can tell you today, according to Paul's writings, and we'll eventually get into these things, Paul said, he went as far as to say, that really a true Jew was a Jew spiritually. See, and here we begin to learn, when I say that, and when Paul begins to say these things, we, we start to learn that, that God, He used this natural people, this nationality of people, this this carnal state as a great representation, an allegory of something he was doing beyond the natural. All right, let's keep in mind, bear in mind this morning, the natural is significant, it's important. But there's always something larger behind the scenes of the natural, you know. You can think of it like this. If you're walking along on a sunny day, you see a shadow. If the, if the sun is behind you, you see your, yourself as a shadow, you know, directly in front of you on the ground. And you could look at the shadow and say, well, that's my shadow. See, it's kind of shaped like me. And you might, you might think that's important, but there's a reason for the shadow. See, the Bible calls it types and shadows for a reason. It, it, the Spirit casts a shadow into the earth, and we learn these things. Paul the Apostle said we learn by these types and these shadows, these allegories. He said for all of the invisible things of God, he said from the beginning of creation, he said they're clearly understood. They can be seen, Paul said, by the things which were made. That is the tangible things, the visible things. Paul said we look at these visible things and we see patterns. And these patterns open up our understanding to spiritual things. So the shadow on the ground as you walk, it's, it's just a dim reflection of the reality that, that it's a shadow of. And that's the way it is with God. See, we see with the whole thing of the nation of Israel, it's a great thing. It's a great thing. It has a purpose. God has a purpose that hasn't yet fully been realized and fulfilled with Israel. For they, I remind you, according to the Scriptures, according to the book of Revelation, as a natural nation, they will rule the world for a thousand years in the millennial reign of Christ. That's pretty significant, ain't it? But it's just a shadow of something greater. It's just a shadow. Paul said, he who is a, he who is a Jew inwardly, Paul said, is the true Jew. And, of course, some of the natural Jews are Jews inwardly, too. It's kind of like your family. I've, I've often thought of it like this, and I've said this before. I would rather be with my Christian family than I would my blood relatives. That may sound foreign to some people, but it's, it's a fact. It's a fact with me, and it's a fact with a lot of Christians I know, at least mature Christians that I know. And I've told people before, I remember talking to a man one time and he got upset with me when I said that because he was one of my relatives. He, he was actually in my family. He was uh, immediate family, to be more specific. And he thought that was just the wrong outlook, you know, that I favored my church family over my carnal family. And here's the thing, like I was saying with the scriptures here, you know, concerning the Jew, there's some Jews that are outward, but they're a Jew inward too. Some of my natural family are also my church family. See, that's really good then. You, you get the best of both worlds. I would prefer it be that way with all of my extended family, of course. You know, when you're in the church with your church family and you have blood relatives there who are also your church family, they are special to you. You know, that you, you have a lot of common ground with them you may not have with others. But I hope you understand what I'm saying this morning. We have relatives. You have relatives and family that are not Christians. They don't believe. And some of them will never believe. 
You know, that's just life. That's the way it is. Everybody has a sovereignty. Everybody has free will. We don't want to give up on them. Not until the end of time. Not until we draw our last breath. We should pray for them. We should be there for them if they ever reach out, you know, in a spiritual way. We love them to the end. But the reality is, not all of them are going to come to Christ. You know, we have extended family. You think about it, the whole human race is your family. You know, we're, we're, all, many, we're all cousins, many times removed, somewhere along the way. So not all of the family is going to be saved. And that's nothing, you know, I'm not making light of that. It's a serious thing. But as we mature in the Lord, we, we learn that our natural carnal family is a shadow of something greater. They're a shadow of our spiritual family, which is our true family. Paul said, he who is a Jew inwardly is the true Jew. See, Paul saw that in his day. When Christ came, it opened up the Old Testament for Apostle Paul and the other apostles. For the first time, they began to properly interpret the Old Testament. They knew then that it was types and it was shadows and it was allegories of something greater to come. Paul said it like this on one occasion. He said, I count all my former learning as dung. One translation says rubbish. Dung is a little more derogatory, a little rougher. You know, he says, I count it all as dung that I might obtain to the excellency which is in Christ. And Paul had, his former learning was, not, was nothing to balk at. You know, it was nothing to dismiss. Paul was trained by the elite of his day. He went to, you know, what would be considered an Ivy League college in our day. He was trained by a man named Gamaliel, who was the top teacher of his time, the most celebrated, the most decorated, the man with the greatest academic credentials in the law of Moses was Gamaliel. We read it, you know, earlier in the Bible. And Paul was trained by him. So Paul, would, Paul had the knowledge, you know, of the Old Testament better than anybody. But Paul got to a place in Christ when he began to see the reality. When he saw beyond the shadow and he saw the spiritual, that which was casting the shadow, that which the shadow was a dim image of. Paul said, I count all my former learning as dung that I might obtain to the excellency which is in Christ. See, he knew he had gotten a hold of something that was so far beyond anything he had ever gotten a hold of before. Ever before. And see, that's what I'm talking about here with Peter. He's, he's explaining to them. See, he's telling them here, he says, you know, John, he said, I remember this encounter, this experience with the Gentiles. It made me remember, Peter said, what happened or what Jesus said when He said, John baptizes with water. He said, but there's, there's one coming, the Christ. He baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And see, right there we see the principle I'm talking about. John, the forerunner, baptized with water. That's a shadow. That's an allegory of what was to come, which was the baptism of the Spirit. Completely another universe. Completely different. Altogether different. He said, that's what it made me think of. Peter is there with the Gentiles. Never witnessed this in the history of the world. Never seen a, the Holy Spirit come upon a Gentile like that. Peter said, I'm telling you guys, I witnessed something incredible. I saw the reality. We've been in the shadows, Paul, uh, Peter could have said, all these centuries. We've been in the shadows. You know, the law and the prophets was a great thing. Paul said it like this, or the Bible said it like this on another occasion. It said that, that uh, uh, the law of the prophets had a glory. He said, but compared to the new covenant, which is in Christ, he said, the former hath no glory at all. It has no glory in comparison. See, at night you look at the moon, and if it's a full moon, you know, it's beautiful. You know, if you're like my wife, she loves the celestial views. She loves a sunset. I've seen her get tears in her eyes over a sunset. That's how it moves her. She has a special passion for that. She loves the starry night. And you can look up into the sky some nights, you know, it's really dark and it's really clear. And some of the heavenly bodies are very bright and very beautiful. But now when the sun comes out the next day, in comparison, they have no illuminosity at all. They disappear, don't they? But they're still there. They're still shining. But in comparison, you can't even see them anymore. They're so dim. See, and that's what the Bible was saying. It was saying that the law and the prophets, see, the forerunner, that which came first, 
It was an awesome thing. The Bible said it had a glory to it. He said, but in comparison to the new covenant of grace, which is in Christ, he said, the former, it hath no glory at all. And see, that's what I'm talking about this morning. It's a great principle if we can see it. Our families today, our natural carnal families, are very special to us because we share a history with them. We don't share with anybody else. It don't matter how close we get to a friend, we can never duplicate what we have with family. If you had a typical family, you know, and I know some people, it's very sad, you know, they weren't brought up in, a, in the right way and they don't share good memories or reasonable history with a, with a sibling, but those of us who were brought up in a normal way, we have siblings. We share a history with them. It's very unique. It's very special. And we may be in a room full of friends, but all of a sudden a sibling comes in. It's like, you just feel something different. It's like, we got a commonality that I just, I can't seem to get with the others. Now, it can get pretty close with a best friend. You know, I had a best friend. He's, he's dead now, but we got really close. I mean, it, it, it was as close as you could get without being a blood relative. And I know that can be really wonderful. But you see what I'm saying this morning. That's, that's a great thing. But according to the Bible, now this is hard for us to get a hold of. Jesus said things at times and he would warn them in advance. He said, if you can receive it. One time he said something and, and, and they walked away from him. I think it was about 70 of them walked off. And Jesus looked at his disciples, the 12, the original. He said, are, are you, you going to leave me too? And, and one of them spoke up and said, no, Lord, where else can we go? You alone have the words of life. In other words, it was hard for us to hear too, but... What, what else do we do? Where else can we go? You may say some hard things, but you also, you say everything that has to do with life, and we can't find that anywhere else. So it's a hard thing sometimes. Some realities in the Word of God are hard for us human beings. But we, can, we will grow into it. It makes more sense as we mature in the Lord, but sometimes you, you just got to lay it out there, you know. Um, according to the Word of God, we have a spiritual family called the church. And it's our real family that the relatives are only a type of. They're only an allegory. They're only a shadow. They are a shadow of the reality which is in Christ. See, Christ is our head. We're the church, the many-membered body. We're the many-membered body. It's like, I have a head. I have many members in my body. In other words, all the fingers are members, the hands, the feet, all these different members to one body. This body is special to me compared to somebody else's body. You know, I look at another body and it's like, well, that's a different body. These members, they have a unique commonality because they're all connected to the same head. See, we're in Christ. We're His body. We're different members. We have different functions. We have different callings. Relatives, other people out in the world who've not been saved, not been baptized into the faith, they're of a different body. We may love them. And they may be destined to be saved. They may come around one day. But until they do, they're connected to a different head. It's a different body. We got to give special attention to our body, the body of believers, the church. In the end, if they are to be saved, it will help them to find their way. If we stay faithful to the Lord, if we stay faithful to the head, which is Christ. The Bible said He's the head of the church. It said in the book of Revelation, He walks amongst the churches. See, and if that's true, and I believe it is, He's here today. I could feel Him this morning in the worship service, especially that last song. Well, that was a good one. I guess that was the first time y'all did that one. That really was stirring me up this morning. I mean, I really felt something. I was getting excited out there. I was starting to feel Pentecostal. I'm telling you, I thought, man, I'm feeling like I might do something a little out of the ordinary here. It was just running through my body. But I found myself out there worshiping and praying. And you can, you can tell sometimes when you feel that, it's like, hey, no wonder some people get, get pretty animated during church. But that's His Spirit. See, the Spirit of Christ was here. He's here, folks. And these things are types and shadows. If we can get a hold of that, Peter was telling them, he was telling them, you know, you've got to understand that I've saw, I've seen this, this special thing, this special event. You know what the thing is? He's referring back in 15 and 16. Peter's referring back to the book of Acts. He's still, it's still Acts chapter 1. If you remember when we read chapter 1, in chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, it says, And while staying with them, 
This is Jesus they're talking about. After he was resurrected, he was with them for 40 days, remember. It says, He, Jesus, ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. He said, For John baptized you with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. You remember, and it happened too, on the day of Pentecost. They were all gathered together. The Bible said they were in one mind, in one accord. That is, they were really unified, like I'm talking about. See, coming together with your church family. Don't let your friends draw you away from your steadfastness with your church family. Don't let your relatives draw you away from your steadfastness with your church family. Because you'll miss out on something great. See, they didn't do that on the day of Pentecost. They were gathered in an upper room. They had been there for days, praying together, you know, fellowshipping one another, really drawn tight together because they had a common bond concerning the faith that the others didn't share. And all of a sudden, the Bible said, like a great and mighty rushing wind, the Spirit of God filled the house. And then it filled the people. And all of a sudden, you could see flames of fire over each one of them's head. You know, a long time ago, I used to wonder what that meant. I thought, what in the world is that? That would have been pretty wild, you know, being in a room full of about 120 people. And all of a sudden, whoosh, and the Spirit comes and poof, everybody's got this flame flickering over their head. And then it dawned on me. The Bible says we're the candle of the Lord. If you're reading the King James Version, it calls it the candle. The candle of the Lord. You know, and he says in one place how the heat can come if you don't do right and remove your candlestick or remove your lampstand, it says in the modern translations. See, he had lit, he had lit the candle. He had lit the lamps. We are God's lamps. See, when he puts the Holy Spirit in you in the Bible, in types and shadows, the Spirit is always symbolic of oil. See, the, the anointing oil. They used to anoint the king before he could rule. They, anoint, they anointed prophets and successors. Sometimes one prophet would anoint another prophet to succeed him. You know, because when they poured the oil on them, it was a type of the Holy Spirit coming down on them. And, and the oil would just run down slowly. They didn't do it like, you know, some churches do today where they just get a little dab on their finger and touch you on the forehead. You know, because we don't want to get all oily and don't want to mess our nice clothes up. And then they would take a flask, you know, and they'd dump it on you. Because in the book of Psalms, it talks about that. It talks about the oil running down the beard of Aaron and down onto his garment. Because it was a type, it was a shadow of the Holy Spirit coming down on God's people. And so in that upper room, God lit them up. See, they were now born again. They now had the fire of God. They were now alive in a way they'd never been alive before. They now had what Paul was talking about when he said, I now count all my former learning as dung. See, they had it. There's two aspects to this. The one is an understanding. The other is his spirit. You know, the Bible said his rod and his staff comforts me over in the book of Psalms. It has to do with the spirit and the word. At the new birth, we get His Spirit, and then we grow in His Word, the grace and knowledge. Notice it speaks of growing in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord. The grace is His Spirit. It's a gracious Spirit. We grow in that measure. The Bible says, for He is dealt unto every man a measure. But it also says we grow in the knowledge of God, which comes through His Word. You know, I know the Bible addresses, you know, family and friends in ways because sometimes it may sound cut and dry to hear something but it's kind of like there's a passage where the Bible dealt with married people how that one may become a Christian and the other may not and Paul addressed this one time and he, he advised the people whether male or female whether husband or wife he said if your mate is not a Christian. And I'm paraphrasing, but he basically said, if your mate is not a Christian, whether it's your husband or your wife, he said, you know, abide with them, stay with them, as long as they're willing. You know, and, and, and specifically when he spoke to the wives, he said, who knows, you could win him through your chaste conversation, you know, your behavior, your good works. You could win him over. He says, but you know, if he's not willing, if he's not, if he's not pleased to dwell with you, Paul said in one translation, he said, you're not... You're not uh, obligated in this situation. God has not joined darkness to light. God has not bound the unbeliever to the believer. He's just saying if it's working out, you know, and, and they're, they're not giving you a hard time and making life impossible for you because you got saved, stay with them a while. See if God can work through you to save them. 
But if eventually you determine that it's not working and they're making your life a living hell, you may have to leave. You may have to leave. The Bible says God has not bound people in such a case. He hasn't bound them. Of course, that only happens if you get married when you're both unbelievers. You know, then one of you gets saved. If you're already a believer, this is the reason the Bible says don't be unequally yoked. You shouldn't end up in that situation if you're already a believer. In other words, if, if a girl is a Christian, she should be dating non-believers. And if a guy's a Christian, he should be dating non-believing girls because he might fall in love. If he falls in love, he's going to want to get married and vice versa. Then you're going to be married to an unbeliever. See, God don't want you in that situation. So we're supposed to, the Bible says, don't be unequally yoked in this way. Uh, it's, for, it's for our own good. But he makes provision for these situations, addressing the issue of people maybe before they got saved, and then one of them gets saved and the other one doesn't. So it's a great thing Peter is trying to relate here, and uh, it tells us in verse 17, uh, if then God, Peter says, if then God gave the same gift to them as He gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard these things, they fell silent, and they glorified God, saying then, saying, then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. Now, I would ask the question this morning, because, you know, we talked last week a lot about the Spirit, you know, having the Spirit inside and what the Spirit is. But I would ask this morning, what is the evidence that a new believer actually has received the Holy Spirit? Now, this gets a little controversial depending on the denomination. There's, there's a few different formulas out there, none of which I subscribe to. I subscribe to the Bible. I don't subscribe to denominational formulas. Different denominations, they have their strong points and they have their weak points. And, and where they're strong in the Word, you know, I, I think they've made some great discoveries. They're all, they, all, they all have done a work for the Lord in the earth. And I've got nothing against them. But at the end of the day, I want to stay with the Word, stay with the Bible. And the Bible tells us, I submit to you this morning, there really is only one proof of the Spirit. And that's the fruits of the Spirit. The Bible said you will know them by their fruits. It didn't say you'll know them by their prosperity. It didn't say you'll know them by how active in the church they are. It didn't say you'll know them because they have a gift. They can prophesy, speak in tongues. They run around the church. They swing from the chandeliers during the song service. Whatever they're doing, no matter how excited they seem, no matter how loud they say amen and clap during the service, it didn't say you could know a true believer in that way. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, for instance, Jesus said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. He said, You will recognize them by their fruits. See, what are fruits? It's attributes. You know, it's behavior. It's words. It's your life. It's, it's this kind of thing. In Luke chapter 6, he says it like this. This is Jesus talking again. He said, For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from the bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. In other words, what's in there is going to come out. That's the fruit. He's telling you right here what fruit is. Like a tree, there's something in the tree. There's an orange tree has an orange nature in there, you know, and, and it's going to push forward until fruit show up. And you know what kind of tree it is once the fruit shows up, right? Some, some plants, some trees, some bushes are very similar. But... The issue is settled once the fruit comes forth. You may have some, you know, may have some wiggle room to argue your side of what you think it might be before, but once the fruit comes, there's, there's no arguing. You know what that is. If it produces bananas, it's a banana tree. If it produces oranges, it's an orange tree. If it produces apples, it's an apple tree. And so we know, according to the Scriptures, that the only proof that we or our friends or our family or our church or our preacher or our leaders, whoever they are, 
We know them by their fruit. See, so often, I've seen this happen, and I'm going to say this as we start to close this morning. I know personally, folks, I've been involved in ministry for a long time. I've known a lot of preachers, a lot of churches, and I know people personally. I could, I could name three, which I'm not going to do, of course, but I know three people come to mind immediately, preachers who had affairs with women in the church. And they are three of the best preachers I have ever heard in my life. And that's a fact. I'm not saying that, you know, just to speak in what they call a hyperbole. I'm being serious. I thought they were the, some of the best. I mean, they could preach. They had a charismatic personality. They had a way of delivering the Word of God. They spoke with authority. It was amazing. But I know all three of these men were like that. Well, two more than maybe the third. The third, though, had a, had a pretty strong personality, too. Just trying to be honest with you. I would have never, you would never have guessed it just listening to them preach. But, see, you cannot judge them by their preaching. The Bible said it's by the fruit. See, they begin to produce fruits of adultery and fornication. Now, they still, for a season, I watched some of them preach after they did that, even after they were caught. Seen them try to press on with their ministry. And they would seem so anointed sometimes. And I, it's baffling. But I'm just trying to make a point. Remember I said this morning, some things are hard. You know, you learn some things in God's Word sometimes. It's like, wow, never heard it like that before. Never considered that. That's kind of hard to get my head around. It all makes sense. The more you learn, the more of the Bible as a whole you learn, it all begins to come together like a puzzle and it makes sense. The Bible teaches us that we are known by our fruits because, see, the fruit is a manifestation of what's inside. That's all. These men had talents for speaking. They had charismatic personalities. You know, I mean, I can name movie stars on TV that could grab a mic, give them a little time to practice, and you'd think they were a preacher because they're great actors. They have great personalities. They have a, a kind of a gift for this kind of thing. And I know people, they get so caught up in it, you know? And if you look at them, they're not right with God either. The people that tend to follow hard after these folks and are so quick to get over and forgive all these things. It's like, well, you know, hey, we're all human. We all make mistakes. I'll help you start your new church. And, you know, he just ran off with his buddy's wife. Now, there's a place for repentance. I'm not going to try to get too deep into all of that. God will forgive anybody for virtually anything. But we're talking about ministry, you know. You can't be so quick to put somebody behind the pulpit again after some issue like that. You know, there's, there's, you've got to have some trustworthiness there, you know, so that they can, uh, they can do God's work. Because without, if people don't have confidence in the preacher, he's really unable to do anything for God. He's unable to win souls. But I've seen it, folks, and I'm only saying this and bringing this up. This may be startling to some of you. But I, I've been in these circles a long time, you know, and I had to distance myself from certain groups, certain churches, certain people. Because when I saw this, I still like some of these people as a person, but I can't spend time with them and I can't be part of their lives because they, some of them still believe they're great prophets and great men of God, you know, after doing stuff like that. Some of them done it multiple times, over and over. And yet they still have followers that claim they are a prophet of God. My problem is, where can you find in the whole Bible a prophet of God that lived like that? See, what am I talking about? Talking about fruits of the Spirit. See, they have devils living inside of them. Not God's Spirit. God's Spirit doesn't produce that kind of fruit. But the devil's Spirit does. And uh, that's what we have to be aware of. Let's go to Galatians. You, don't, you can turn there if you want to, but you don't have to. I know we're... We're teaching out of Acts, but these are some side scriptures that uh, go along with what I'm saying this morning. In Galatians chapter 5, for instance, Apostle Paul here gives us what he calls the works of the flesh, which could be called the fruits of the Spirit too, the wrong spirit that is. He says in uh, chapter 5 verse 18 in the book of Galatians, Paul says it like this, but if you are led by the Spirit, talking about God's Spirit, you are not under the law. That is the law of Moses. You know, it's kind of the same today. If you're led by a Spirit that keeps you from breaking the law, you're doing good in your community, you're not going to be under the wrath of your local police department, right? You're not under the law. 
That's what he was saying here, spiritually speaking. If, if you're led by the Spirit of God, you're not going to find yourself under God's law, under His judgment. It says in 19, Now the works of the flesh, Paul says, are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality. The NLT renders sensuality as lustful pleasures. Idolatry, sorcery, enmity. The NLT renders Enmity is hostility. Strife can be rendered quarreling. Jealousy, he says, fits of anger, rivalries. NLT renders rivalries as selfish ambition. Dissension, these are works of the flesh, remember, fruits of the wrong spirit, he's naming. Dissensions can be uh, defined as, uh, one definition says, a disagreement that leads to discord see some people do that that's, that's their nature they'll go around just with dissension causing discord among a group of people you ever get one like that in the church you know they'll pretty soon people in the church are getting upset with each other because they're spreading discord they're starting to talk about the wrong thing and they're carrying stories and we've been very fortunate God's really helped us in these areas you know our little church is really everybody's been such good friends and stuck together Envy is another one in verse 21. The definition, one definition for envy is a feeling of discontentment over and resentful longing aroused by someone else's possessions, qualities, or luck. Drunkenness, orgies. Orgies can be uh, the NLT version. The uh, New Living Translation actually renders that, that uh, Greek word as wild parties. See, I know people like this. You may know some of them too. I mean, I'm just getting real with you a little bit this morning. I know it gets, it gets the feeling a little intense when you go down some of these trails, but folks, it's so real. I mean, we got to get real. We got to get real with ourselves if we're to make progress in the faith. I know people like this. They go to wild parties. Some of them throw wild parties. And they will look you in the eye and tell you they're on their way to heaven. And if you ever say anything to admonish them or try to help them or try to invite them to church or indicate to them at all that hey, you may not be on the right path, brother, they'll jump down your throat tell you right quick you're judging them. <clears throat> now, let me say this real quick as a side note. Judging, that's one of the biggest misunderstandings, biggest misnomers in the Bible. The Bible never said not to, to judge. It was speaking of judging people, not behaviors. The Bible teaches we are to judge behaviors. We're just not to lay eternal judgment on people. The Bible said it's up to God whether His servant stands or falls. And Paul said, judge nothing before it's time. In other words, wait until the day of judgment. God will decide which way they're going. But we are to judge behaviors. The Bible says to use godly judgment in one place. The Bible says, know you not that ye shall judge angels, Paul said. He said, how much more of the lesser things of this life? So this is, that's just something people say who, who are not living for God and they don't want nobody to judge their behaviors. They're always like, don't judge. Can't judge. The Bible says judge not. The Bible meant don't judge the people. You are to judge the behaviors or else how are you to interpret God's Word? How are you to know what to do and how to live yourself? But I've met people like this that have all of these, these qualities, or these, I should say, non-qualities. And they may, we all stumble into these non-qualities. See, that's the thing. As a born-again believer, your life exhibits the fruits of God's Spirit, whereas you will have episodes of, of something else showing up in your life. But it should be momentary. It should be something we feel conviction over, something we repent over. See, that will go on to the day we leave this world because we are to what the Bible calls fight the good fight. It's called a fight for a reason. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. But they're not. It's not easy. But it's possible. By the Spirit of the Lord, He will empower us. Now notice, He says in, um, as part of verse 21, after the, after the mention of wild parties, He said, in things like these, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, did you hear that? Paul says, I warn you. 
People that do these things, that is, this is their fruit in life, selfish ambition, wild parties, anger, fits of rage, jealousy, quarreling, sexual immorality, impurity. You know, you could put labels on this and get more specific, you know. But Paul is being very general here. You, you can add your own activities that fit under these categories. He said people that do these things will never inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, they can't make it to heaven. They can't get into heaven. If they die in this condition, this is their nature, they won't make it. But then he goes on in Galatians 5 and in verse 22 to say, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. In other words, if you practice these things, you don't have to worry about God ever getting after you for anything, you know? You don't have to worry about this. You're not under His law when you live like this. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Now, if we have the Spirit of God inside of us, we will exhibit the fruits of the Spirit that we see in Galatians 5. It doesn't mean we'll be perfect in these things. And it doesn't mean we'll never exhibit the bad fruits that I read off here. Sometimes people backslide. But like I said, if they've been born again, if they're true Christians, if they've truly been converted, they're not going to turn back and just stay in that life and that become their fruit. See, they're not going to do that. It may be something they do in a moment of weakness. They may go through an episode of life where something really upsets them and the devil's able to trip them up. He lays a trap for them. You, know, you see what I'm saying? And they get stumbled up and they find themselves temporarily kind of overtaken. Paul addressed this. You remember he said, if you see your brother overtaken in a fault, he said, you who are spiritual, go to such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourselves, lest you also, it could happen to you, he said. He said, you go to him in the spirit of humility and try to restore him. So we could, we could fall into these bad behaviors that I just read. But we're going to not feel good about it. I remember my best friend I was telling you about earlier that I said died. His name was Tim. And uh, he used to say this every so often. Because he was a former alcoholic and brawler, drug addict. Would rob you at gunpoint. I mean, literally, he'd put a pistol to you and just take your money. Go get what he wanted. You wouldn't know that if you met him after he got saved. Would they, Kelly? There's, there's several in the room that, that, that know this man or knew him before he died. He was like a big teddy bear. Just to, just to show how God could change a man. This was a big, a bulky guy, strong, strong as an ox, scary. I, I'd hate to have tied up with him back in the day when he was mean. Jason got a chance to meet him. He's from Kentucky like Jason. Really, he was a tough guy. He was a real tough guy. He wasn't the kind that went around pretending to be. But God turned him around, changed his heart. He was the nicest guy you'd ever meet. And if he was your friend, he was loyal. He would take up for you. He'd give you the shirt off his back. Just a good-hearted, good-spirited person. And he, and he started preaching the gospel. He got in the Bible. He read it like 23 times all the way through. I mean, very strong-spirited, outgoing kind of guy, you know. He had, had a lot of ambition and energy. Read that Bible through and through and would preach the gospel. But the Spirit of God changed him. But before it changed him, he wasn't that way. He wasn't that way. He could be pretty rough. But, you know, the thing that I was going to say about him was, he told me, this was funny, he used to say this. He'd laugh and he'd say, he'd say, bro, God can ruin a good drunk. Because he, he tried backsliding a few times after he got saved. And, of course, he'd immediately, like all of us, when you backslide, when you withdraw from God, something happens. The first thing you do is you gravitate back toward whatever it was you used to do. You look for your comfort zone. Look at the apostles when, when, when Jesus didn't fulfill the thing they thought He should at first and, and they didn't realize He was going to be put to death like they did. And The Bible said the first thing they did is they went back fishing. You know, that's what they were doing when Jesus met them. You know, he, he pulled them away from their boats and fishing nets. He said, come with me. I'm going to make you fishers of men. But when it didn't seem to work out and Jesus didn't take over Israel and throw off the yoke of the Roman occupiers like they thought, raise them back up. But rather, he, he was convicted of capital punishment and he, and he died. 
they all went back fishing. You know, it's like, wow, we, we just we missed something along the way. And that's what we do when we backslide. We go back to whatever it is we used to do, back to old habits, back to whatever feels comfortable and, and relative. It's, it's, you know, it's kind of comfy to go back into something we were used to. And Tim told me, he said, Brother God, he, he'll mess up a good drum. Because he told me before he got saved, he could get drunk and enjoy himself. And I know a lot of times it ends in disaster, but if, if you happen to have a drunken episode that doesn't end in disaster, it's usually pleasurable. You enjoy getting that way, you enjoy everything. But he said he couldn't enjoy it anymore. He said, man, I just can't enjoy it no more. He messes up a good drum. And I thought, that's so true. It's that way with everything. You, you delve back into pornography. It may come off like a thrill at first, but if you've been saved before, you know, you feel like a dog when it's over. You feel so dirty and messed up. And anything. If you go back to any old habit, you used to have drugs, alcohol, cussing, uh, whatever. You know, sometimes you get in a rage and before you know it, you're flying off the handle and cuss words are just flowing. And they feel pretty good at the moment. You know, it's like, I'm so mad, I just, I need to let that steam off. You are letting them fly. But if you really, if you really are saved, a minute or two is going to pass and you're going to hear them words ringing in your ear that you just said. It's going to be like, wow, I thought I was over that. How could I still do something like that, Lord? You know, and the devil will make us think we never got saved. But don't think that. Just showing you how... Don't be discouraged. You know, we're going to do things that's on the bad list here sometimes. But the goal is to do them less and do them less and do them less as we grow in the Lord and we, we keep our eyes focused on the goal, which is to be more like Jesus. The Bible teaches that He has shared with us His divine nature. And the more of that spirit that we get, the more we're going to be like Him and the less we're going to manifest these bad fruits, the more we're going to manifest the good fruits, which you remember one of them was self-control. Yep. Well, I hope that you've enjoyed it this morning. I hope you got something out of it. I hope I said something you can take with you today to better your lives. The Word of God is so wonderful today. I love the Lord. and I Really, it's a great pleasure. It's a great privilege to stand up here and to share the Word of God with you, to share my heart with you on these things. And I just want to be honest with you. And I want to preach it the way the Lord has had it written in the Bible. Uh, and I appreciate you coming today. appreciate you showing up, being with us. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and call up the musicians so they can send us off with a song this morning. But before I turn the mic over to them, can somebody say amen this morning? Amen. 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 Can we give the Lord a hand this morning? Praise the Lord.